verse 26. I'm going to read verse 21 and we'll come back and go through the remainder of those verses as we are trying to enlighten all of us, include myself, on this passage. Matthew 5, 21. You have heard it said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment been preaching and teaching out of Matthew, just directed there, nothing that I'm studying in school, no other books, just simply directed just to get into Matthew. Where you find this passage of scripture is called frequently the Sermon on the Mount. We have been studying on Wednesday night the Beatitudes. Those who've been there on Wednesday, they have been memorizing them and they should have them memorized by now. I'm also committing this portion of scripture to memory for me personally uh, as we work through this. And it is a sermon that the Lord gives to the multitude on the mountain. And when he is done, this crowd is going to know that of all the voices that they've ever heard, they have never heard a man preach or teach as Jesus did with authority. That's exactly how Matthew said it. And that is because he wasn't dependent upon what the scholars had to say or the experts. He could, in fact, say himself, I say unto you. He's not, re he's not having to repeat or go back to anybody else. He says, I'm talking. And he does it with authority. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. There are in verses 21 down to verses 48, he's going to cover six particular sins or highlight six particular sins or commandments and he's going to repeat them but he's going to repeat them and give their total intended message differently from what they've been hearing them before. For example in verse 41 you've heard it said he talks about killing. In verse 27 you've heard it said but I say he's going to talk about adultery. The next time I stand before you that will be the sermon. If you look in uh, Matthew 5 and verse uh, 32, uh, verse 31, he says, you've heard it says, and this one he talks about putting away the spouses, divorce. We're going to talk about that. In verse 33, uh, thou shalt not forswear or swearing, making oaths. We're going to talk about that one. Verse 38, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye, two for two, but I say unto you. And then verse 43, he talks about loving, hating your enemy, loving your friends, he says, but I say. These are six areas that he's going to teach on and he's going to highlight them. And he could have done more, but he chose himself these six. And of the six, the first one he spoke about was the subject of killing or murder, if you want to put it that way, or slaying. Why that subject? Because it was a problem in that day, and it is a problem today. Still a problem. Now stay with me. Got some statistics for you. He did not say you read it. He said you heard it. Now they should have read it. There are often two reasons that I, when I read that phrase, you've heard it says, one might be because the crowd was illiterate and couldn't read, but I doubt that to be the case. And the other may be is that they were dependent on what others said to them, which is normally what people do. You hear a lot of times people say, well, doesn't it say somewhere, didn't somebody tell me one time in the Bible? And I said, okay, but did you read it for yourself? Or are you only repeating what you heard somebody else say? And that is a common problem. It's common then, it's common today, that we often have what we've heard about the Bible without doing a, a research or a reading or a study of it for ourselves. Is eating an apple wrong today like it was then? Well, that tells you somebody hadn't read their Bible. Because if they'd have read their Bible, they would have found out it said nothing to do with the apple. But it's amazing how repeated things, the often they're repeated, seem as though they're the facts. And they're not. And so there were some things that had been stated. And Jesus is going to go back and say, you heard it. But I want to see if you heard it like I 
intended it. And so the best way is, I'm not going to address what the scholars or the prophets or who came after me, whatever was said, I want you to hear it from me as I intended it for it to be. And so he goes back over this again. Verse 21, you've heard it said of old time, thou shall not kill. This is a moral commandment. And to me, it makes sense. As a human being, I can, I can say this honestly. I don't know of occasion other than self-preservation where I have ever thought about taking somebody's life innocently. Some of you watch uh, what they call uh, 48 hours. And when you read it, you, when you see it, you're wondering, what were these people thinking? That they would just go out and gun down a man, a woman, a group of men, a group of women. And when you interview them, they have no remorse. The only thing they feel bad about is that they got caught. And even when they get caught and the evidence is against them, they still deny it. It wasn't me. Well, gun in your pocket, wasn't me. Blood on your shoes, it still wasn't me. Well, who was it? It was Leroy. But they blame other people for what happened, and it was, in fact, them. And I've often wondered, well, what would make you want to think about this? Take another breathing human being's life. That you would just, for whatever, just say, that person I am going to kill. You have to, you got to travel down some highways to get there. You really have to get, you have to, you got to go a little bit to get to where you would just randomly. The man who climbed up in this hotel room in Vegas, they're still trying to figure out what made him get there. Not to take one life, random lives. Tampa, right now, we have a shooter in Tampa who just driving around Tampa, Florida, randomly shooting people he don't know, have never had any reactions to them, and he's just picking random targets. There's no rhyme or reason, color, gender, he's shooting, and they really want to find this guy because he's a killer. And I heard the uh, mayor of the city, it, it may not be politically wreck, correct, but I like his term, he said, bring me his head. He said, I don't care what you do, we must get this guy or girl, whoever it may be. Now, that means killing. Problem then, problem now. Let me give you a few stats. I'm going to shock you. Can you imagine, have you ever thought about what country has the highest murder rate in the world? Who would you guess it is? It's not. Shocking, isn't it? The highest murder rate of any country in the world is Honduras. Second, El Salvador. Third, Venezuela. All are either South American countries or things of that nature. And they try to study the social, economic issues that creates this kind of climate that one area becomes a cesspool of murder. And so they try to study this thing. Uh, Jamaica is number five on the list for murder. I put it this way, per capita. So if you've got, if you've got a thousand people, ten thousand people, Honduras has the highest murder rate per capita than any other city. South Africa is on this list. Number eight is South Africa. Bahamas Islands is number ten. Brazil is number fourteen. When you get down to number twenty-five. Per capita, you still have not gotten to the U.S. See, we know our problem, but what I'm trying to say is the murder rate around the world is still worse than ours. And what we have in our country shocks us, which lets you know that this is epidemic worldwide. The countries that have the least murder rate are islands, uh, countries like Iceland. And there's one other small little country that had 0.1 murder. And I don't know how you can have 0.1. Uh, but they do put percentages on this thing. What would you think would be the world's largest city with the highest murder rate? <laughs> I 
The highest city per capita, 10,000, is Caracas, Venezuela. The second is Acapulco. San Pedro is the third in Honduras. And as you work down through these cities, Cape Town is number 13. Uh, interestingly, you don't get to any cities per capita until you get to number 34, and it is not Chicago per capita. It's New Orleans. New Orleans, Louisiana. And then you have one more on this list per capita. After you get to New Orleans, you get to some other cities in the US. That's per capita, not based on how many murders, but per capita. I said 10,000, it might be 100,000 per capita. Now US, we're going world, country, now we're to the US. What do you think is the city with the highest murder rate per capita? Don't be scared, you've been guessing before, go and guess again. You're not going to flunk. Nope. Most people would say Chicago, but it's not. City in our state, St. Louis. Second to that, Baltimore, per capita. I think it's per 100,000. I've given the wrong figure. But if there's 100,000 people, there's more murders in this city per 100,000 than any other city. New Orleans is third, Detroit is fourth, Birmingham, Alabama is number five, Kansas City is number 16, and Chicago is number 18 per capita. Keep in mind, Chicago is a large city, so I'm talking about per capita. But Chicago has the highest murder rate per city, but not per capita. At this point in time, Chicago is boasting something like 478 murders, 2017. Yesterday, two days ago, Kansas City reported that we're at murder 120, and on, we've already surpassed where we were last year, and every major city in America, and every major city in the world, and every country is on pace to break the records that they've had in the past. 90%, 96% of all the murders that are not war related, and these are all statistics that are not wartime statistics, 96% of them are committed with guns. And the rest of them are by poison or stabbing or running over with a car or something of that nature. The economists, socialists, philosophers, they study human nature and they try to figure out what make people tick in a certain area. They figured out that social economics has some basis on crime, violent or murder. They tried to find, matter of fact, South America didn't surprise me because the drug trade, wherever you have a high drug trade, there's usually um, a high murder rate because people who want to be rich will murder other people, other gangs, rob, steal, and so it goes up. Kidnap and kill. So it's high. You can say that our issue is we've got too many guns. If we got rid of guns, we'd get rid of murder. There's debatable because people committed murders long before guns were created. Now I'm from the South. I'm from, I'm from uh, Southern Arkansas. And as a child, I can remember those old trucks down in Arkansas I, it didn't matter if it was hunting season or not. Roosevelt, you know what I'm getting ready to say. What did everybody ride around with in their truck? Shotgun or rifle. Everybody had guns. But did you have a gun as a kid? Okay. What'd you do with it? Okay. Did you, did you go out in the woods with it? What'd you do with it then? What'd you hunt? Ant, rabbits, and squirrels. You see, we did that as children. It never crossed our mind to level a gun at another human being. We had fights in school. You have fights in school, Brother Strickland? Okay. Too many of them? Lost them all, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, we have fights in school. You know, you, you, you fight with Eddie, you throw your blows, you re meet by the train track, then you go play basketball. 
But to do a drive-by on somebody's house never crossed our mind. You see, we had something posted in our churches that says, thou shall not. We had it posted in our courthouses. And we also had it posted in our schools. But then we removed them. We removed them from the courthouses. We removed it from the schools. Hopefully we've kept it our churches. And we saw something begin to happen in the nation. And the trend has only been going up and up. Couple that, couple that with drugs. And you couple that with violent pictures, movies, and video games. Couple it. When, when you wrap a ribbon around all of that stuff, you have created an environment. Someone says social economics, but we were poor growing up, but that was no excuse to kill anybody. You were poor, you might not have had a two chickens or a chicken, but that didn't mean you need to go kill somebody. That wasn't going to get you any more chickens. Well, they could. It depends on how you got them. <laughs> but let me not go on that end, okay? Uh, what I'm saying is poverty, socioeconomic uh, deprivation is not a real reason to kill somebody. It's a reason to work harder but it is not a reason to say, I'm angry. Life is not fair. So I'm going to get my just dues. Somebody owes me something. It doesn't matter how I do it. It's wrong reasoning. And so when Jesus addresses this subject, he doesn't talk of social economics. He doesn't talk about uh, anything else. He talks from a spiritual. And I wished I had an audience. And the only place I can get an audience is on the streets in the prison because I want to tell people if, if, they could, if I could reach people I want to tell any man or woman or girl or little boy who's thinking about killing another person it is absolutely wrong according to God I, wanted, I would want to show you how senseless it is and there is a penalty because you know the deal you murder someone's family member, they don't tell the police because their intention is to come get you back. Okay? And when you do murder someone, if you get caught, you're not going to spend the 30 or 40 plus all your life in jail over one dumb decision that you can't take back, but it's going to cost you the rest of your life. Behind bars, behind bars, and you have no freedom. And I don't know any person logically thinking that would make that decision, but people do. Even when they, quote unquote, know what the consequences are. Now, the subject matter of the Lord's message is this. Don't kill. Now, let's walk through a little bit of scripture because I want to know <laughs> where did murder start from in the first place? You know your Bible? So if you turn to Genesis 4, you're going to find the first murder in Scripture. And watch this. It's not a stranger killing a stranger. It's not wartime where one soldier kills another soldier. It is not uh, something where someone broke in your house and you woke up in the middle of the night and you defended yourself. This is one blood brother killing another blood brother. Fratricide. Fratricide. And the Bible says that when you read Genesis 4, you're not given all the details of the story, but you find the scripture says that Cain and Abel talked in the field. And somehow, after that discussion, something got a hold of Cain that he decided the best thing to do. And the scripture, I kept looking it up. Why did God say the word in Genesis, it says Cain slew? 
Didn't say he killed him, said he slew. Every time I read it, even in 1 John, the word there in 1 John where it talks about this, it says slew. Because looking up the Hebrew and the Greek word, it meant not only kill, but kill with injury, butchered, brutality. It's the individual that not only stabs one time, but maybe stabs 50 times, overkill. Sometimes with the idea of mutilating. This is, this is what Cain did to his brother Abel, and, and he's the first one in, in the Bible that we know of that, that the records of anyone being killed by another human. Now let me walk through this. How did this happen? Watch me now. When a man, now remember, Cain was not a murderer from birth. Some people said that boy or girl going to be a killer. They weren't born that way. They make choices. But the first step is Cain was out of fellowship or relationship with God. Let's start there. Whenever a man or woman gets out of relationship with God, they open themselves up to be in a relationship with another. And the Lord warned him. He warned Cain. He told Cain, he said, now listen, if you do well, it's good. But if you don't, he said, you, you better be careful. There's something knocking trying to get inside of you and alter you from what I made you therefore I'm warning you you don't have an excuse and so he, he, he out of relationship with God and the moment you get out of relationship with God there is no neutral ground you either going to be with God or you're going to be with Satan there's nothing in the middle Jesus said if you're not for me you're either going to be in the light or be in the darkness, not this twilight zone, either going to be one or the other. And in this case, he moved from being in a relationship with God, but the moment he took himself out of relationship with God, he opened himself up to Satan's suggestions. He opened him up to be, himself up to be a two. Look up in 1 John, I can prove this, chapter 3. 1 John is going towards Revelation. Not St. John, but 1st John. Trying to help you all I can. 1st John 3. Watch the Bible. Look, if you would, in verses 12. He's talking about we should love one another, but then he says, not as Cain. And notice who he attaches Cain to. He was of that wicked one. You see, the moment you, 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 the moment you move away from God, you instantly have put yourself at Satan's disposal. That's why people say, well, something got in me. Or I don't know why I did this. I snapped. That's one of the pictures on TV. It's not only 48 hours. They got another one called Snapped. And after you watch it for a while, you say, boy, these people really did snap. But why did they snap? Because they put themselves at disposal. You open up the door, not of a suggestion. It goes beyond suggestion. It goes into carrying out the very act that is suggested because you don't have no help from God. It's just you and the devil and you by yourself. Now notice, it says, who was of the wicked one and he slew his brother. And the scripture says, and wherefore slew he him? This is the other thing. You see, Cain's problem was with God. But he killed Abel. And when a man or woman has a spiritual problem, they think they can handle a spiritual problem by physical means. And your problem is not with man. If you have a problem with God, don't think man is the solution or killing a man or woman is the solution. Are you, are you hearing that? Hear, hear that well. When you got a problem with God, you'll never solve it by dealing with man. A lot of persons say, I'll get rid of this man. I'll get rid of this woman. And my problem will go away. Cain killed Abel. Guess who talked to him after that? God. 
Where's your brother? I don't know. What'd you do with him? I don't know. Brother gone. God's still here. So even though you dealt with your brother, your problem started with me, you still got to deal with me. You can kill a man, you cannot kill God. And for every man or woman who kills a man or woman, you still have to answer to Almighty God. There's no way out of that. And all the time people think if I get rid of this person, it gets rid of my problem. Now, what about capital punishment when you, you know, when you have to take someone's life in society? Turn to Genesis 9, verse 6. Let's see if we can get a good understanding. Genesis is the first book in the Bible. <laughs> chapter 9 is chapter 9. Verse 6 is verse 6. The scripture says, Whosoever sheddeth man's blood, are you there? By man shall his blood be shed. For he is in the image of God, for in the image of God made he man. Now the speaker here is God giving Noah and this new society that Noah is establishing with his family when he walks out on the ark, instructions, what to eat, what not to eat, what to do with blood, but also here is as a, as a you see we are individuals, but when we come together as more than one individuals, groups of individuals, we now set an order of how we want to be governed and then we authorize our government to act on our behalf based on our agreed structure. That's how governments are formed. At least it should be. And our agreed structure is we've given authority to those that we elect to represent us to carry out what we believe collectively should be our wishes. In this case, he says, among you living, if a man kills a man, shed that man's blood, by man, men who have agreed together, you, you can take that person's life. Someone said, well, that's not going to rehabilitate. It's not about rehabilitation. This is strictly what God says. By man's, man who sheds blood, his blood. This is called accountability. It's called reaping what you sow. Now, who said this? The same John 3.16 God said this here. And when someone said, and I, I know the arguments out there, but and I, the only reason I have a problem with capital punishment, if I have a problem and I do, is that I hate a system that allows certain people to get off when they're guilty. And I hate a system that money determines whether you get the max or not. When it's not fair, I have a problem with it. But when it is fair, it should be fair to everybody under the system. No exceptions. In our system, we go well beyond because we not only convict someone, it's 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 years later before they do anything. And by that time, people are saying, well, shouldn't the heat of that be gone? No, because God's word is they kill somebody. That principle has not been moved. Now stay with me. Uh, Exodus 21. And I hear you. You say, shouldn't we forgive them? You can forgive a person and justice can still be served. You can forgive. You can absolutely say, I forgive a person. But a society that is just has to perform its just duties. In Exodus chapter 12, a uh, 21, I should say, and look at verses 12 through 14. I might have said 12, but 20, Exodus chapter 21. Repeat. It's in Exodus 20, you find thou shalt not kill. You find it reiterated. He that smiteth a man, Exodus 21, 12, so that he dieth, he shall surely, he shall be surely put to death. Now, exception. 
If a man lie not in wait, but God deliver him into his hand, then I will appoint thee a place where he shall flee. You say, preacher, what is he talking about? When someone does something accidentally, you're hunting, and you shoot, you miss, you kill someone down the road, God made allowances for that one. And he called them cities of refuge so that someone who slayed someone but they didn't intend to, the person who does it intentionally doesn't have access to this exception. Look, if you would, in verse 14. But if a man come presumptuously, we call that premeditated, fought it out. By the way, they're finding that the man that was in the hotel room in Las Vegas, they looked on his internet. He, he, he had been checking out how the police in Las Vegas responded. He had checked out every detail. He had cameras in the hallway so he could see them coming and spot them. This man didn't just do something spontaneously. He had thought this thing totally 100% out. He thought it out. But it says, if a man come presumptuously upon his neighbors to slay him with guile, thou shalt take him from mine altar. It doesn't matter if he at church. Now, you know the setting here. But he says, you still got to judge him. You know, even if he's got a little worship going on, you still got to deal with him according to scripture. Him or her. Now, I didn't put that there. That's God. Now, you said, but I want to forgive him. You can. Look at Exodus 35. Stay with me, please. Thou shalt not kill. Look at verse 16. Exodus 35, 16. I won't read all of this, but I want you to read from verses 16 through 24 uh, when you get a chance. Did I say Exodus 35? Hold on. I might want numbers. Hold on. I think I wrote the wrong book down. That's it. Is that right? All right. Through 16. Nope. Numbers 35. R right chapters. Right book. I mean right verses. Wrong book. Now again he talks about the cities of refuge. I won't go through all of this. But again to show you that this idea of rep retribution is solid. Except for when it is something what we call accidental. God gave, he, he made allowances. The scripture says in verse 16 of, of uh, Numbers, Numbers, Numbers 35, 16, says, and if he smite him with an instrument of iron so that he die, he is a murderer. And the murderer shall what? Put to death. And if he smite him with throwing a stone wherewith he may die, and he die, he is a or if he do it with a piece of wood, he's still a murderer. Yeah. Doesn't matter the means, whether it's by weapon, by wood, by stone, by poisoning, whatever. Still a murderer. And he says what is to take place. You read all 24 verses of that, and you'll find, but if a person does something by accident, a person is not a murderer, and God made allowances for that. Again, the first murder, Cain Abel. What happens when people murder someone innocently? Genesis says you take that person out. Now, what about wartime? We have military people in here or who've been in military. Some of you have been in war zones. We have some Vietnam vets in here. We have some people who fought in, my son was in Afghanistan. So what do you do during the time of war? While you study your Bible, were there times that Israel went to battle? Not only that, what happened to Goliath? David didn't sing him no lullaby. Right? He rocked him to sleep, but he didn't intend for it to be a bedtime. I mean, nursery rhyme. David took him out. David killed him. And you read through the scriptures, there are times where people fought. That's not just starting with David. David was called a man of war. Joshua fit to battle. Jericho. Okay? And you study all of the battles where lives and so many died and some in Israel died. In battle time, you have to do what you got to do because you're protecting a society. And when you're protecting a society, you're protecting the people that live in the society. Some man, some woman, and some child. 
My Bible says in Ecclesiastes there's a time for everything under the sun. It even says there's a time for war and there's also a time of peace. When Jason and I did the same thing with Daryl, Daryl was army, Desert Shield, the second one, Desert Storm, the second one, Desert Shield was the first one. Daryl caught the, he caught Desert uh, Storm. And I wasn't in Vietnam, but I'm just in Vietnam era, and I had a bunch of Vietnam vets around me who had been there, and I kind of knew a little bit of what they had gone through. When Jason went to Afghanistan, both of them will tell you I sit down and talk to them. I got to talk that daddy talk. As a matter of fact, <laughs> you don't know this, but there was one unit where my son Daryl was attached to. That unit was attacked, captured. These were the girls. That was his unit. He was supposed to be on that truck, but they had assigned him somewhere else. And he missed that truck, but he was supposed to be with them. And the night that they announced that unit, I was sitting there glued to my chair. Mama was sleeping. When I heard the unit, I sat up. I didn't sleep all night long. All I could do was pray. But I just sat there all night long and I said, I'm not going to bother one of us being wake is enough. And that next day, he called me. When I heard that phone, I start crying. Not that I was uh, happy that somebody else lost their lives. I wanted to hear his voice. He didn't call me because of what he knew was going on. He just called. But what a time to call. And I didn't go into any details with him, but I sure did thank the Lord then and I thank him now. But here's what, and those, those girls, those were his friends. He worked with them, uh, the Johnson girl. And they, they were all in this, not the unit, they were in the same squad working together. He was supposed to be on that turret, but he got transferred shortly somewhere else. But I told him, and I told Jason, in a serious conversation, by ourselves, I said, I, I want you, when you go over there, that you promise me, in a time of war, you're going to do whatever is necessary to get you and your buddies back home safe. Whatever it takes, you do what's necessary. But I also said to them, don't do no more than that. Because then you've got to sleep with what you've done. And you got to answer. There are some people that went to war, they didn't have to take life, they just wanted the thrill of shooting somebody. You got one unit in Afghanistan that were uh, court martialed because they just wanted to kill and they just went out and shot some civilians, uh, some men, old men, some women and stuff. They were no threat, but they just shot them because they just wanted the thrill of, of killing. I'm glad our government did what was right because that's not what wartime is all about. But during the time of war, you do what you have to do. Look over in Luke chapter 3. Luke 3, verse 18. Some soldiers came to John the Baptist, interested in his message, but they're soldiers. In verse 14 of Luke, and the soldiers likewise demanded of him, talking about John, they wanted to know, if we're going to be right with God, how can we do that being soldiers? What are we supposed to do in uniform? We know what that means. In uniform, you follow orders and do what they tell you. And here's what John said do. He said unto them, and this was my advice to my sons, the word there said do violence, that means don't do no more than you have to do. Don't go beyond. Don't, don't become a warmonger who enjoys the thrill of killing. Don't be the person who will shoot someone just because they're walking down the way and you have a license by the military to kill. You, you, you don't do that. That's what he's telling John. John is telling the soldiers. Now, you're still a soldier, and I want you to do your job, but don't go beyond. Don't become a violent, love violence, love to kill type person. He says, that's not where I want you to go. Now, the last thing on this point, the subject of killing. Cain killed. There's a, sometimes during a time of war, capital punishment. What about protecting your family? What do you do there? 
or yourself. <laughs> Look at Exodus 22. Exodus 22. Now let me get there first so I make sure I got you going to the right place, okay? Exodus 22. We in good shape. Look at verse 2. Hmm. If a Verse 2. If a what? Be found breaking up, broke, breaking up, and be what? Hmm. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me understand. So the person didn't come to kill, they came to steal. Well, you don't know that. You wake up in the middle of the night, there's somebody in your house. You don't ask them, did you come to kill or did you come to steal? <laughs> Is it A or B? Now, they might have come for the stealing, but you don't know their intentions. That's why our laws say that if someone is in your home, your domain, for whatever reason they're in your domain, armed or not armed, come to steal or come to leave something. You don't know. And so you act out of what we call impulse. You act out of self-preservation. You act out of fear. And I heard some Christians say, but uh, when someone comes in to hurt you, and all of that, you just all the, we won't get to that because it's in the chapter. You come, make sure you keep coming. We all just turn the other cheek. We're going to study that verse in a few more weeks. <laughs> and what they're saying is, well, we're just going to let them do what they do and just trust God. What if they come to kill you? What if they come to kill your children? And sometimes they do. What if they come to hurt your wife? You, 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 you got to be some kind of wimpy to just say, I'm just going to. Just let them do what they're going to have to do. Now, if they, this verse says if they just in the house, you don't know the reason. Now watch this. It says they're smitten. There's no blood. There's no guiltiness on your part. But verse 3 says something. But if the sun be risen upon them, and I had to think that through. So if they rob you at night, you can kill them. But if they do it in the daytime, you can't. <laughs> That's not what he's saying. He is saying the incident is over. They stole, they left. Now you can't run them down in the street and say, you stole, I'm killing you. You want to sometimes though, don't you? But that's the implication. Once they're out of your house, once the incident is over, you're no longer fearing for your life. You cannot go out and say, I'm gonna kill them because they stole. No, it's not murder you can do now. You can't slay the person, but you are to make them make restitution. And it's a funny thing about biblical restitution because in the Bible, if you stole something, you would have returned that fivefold, I believe it is. So if you stole one sheep, you brought six sheep back. You stole one TV, you bring six TVs back. You stole one car, you take six cars back. Problem is, they more than likely gonna go steal these other five or six cars to bring back to you. So now you got a dilemma. <laughs> <laughs> are you with me this morning? Now, let's, let's see, what do you do if someone's in your home and, and they're about to hurt you or your family? Go back to Matthew 5. Now remember what we just read in Exodus about what you can do to defend yourself. Look at verse 5, chapter 5, I'm sorry, Matthew 5 and verse 17. Watch Jesus. He says, think not that I'm come to destroy. He didn't come to tear that verse down or the prophets. He says, now I'm going to fulfill everything they wrote, but I did not come to tear the verses that God gave you down, including that one. He says, now not only am I not going to tear it down, he said all of the law, there's things that God wrote, uh, uh, every jot and every tittle has to be fulfilled. He said, I didn't come to change anything. It's not what I came to do. Now, if I'm faced with a moral dilemma, and this is how you have to settle this in your own thinking, because I cannot tell you what to do. That would be unethical, and you might do something I didn't tell you to do. But if I have to make a choice between my wife and my children in my home, I have a moral decision I have to make. One of them is going to be righter than the other. <laughs> <laughs> Look at 
And I'm going to have to take one and just trust God to show me some mercy and grace. You hear what I'm saying? Now, whatever decision you make under those circumstances, you might be faced with a moral decision. And when that happens, you'll have to choose one or the other. And then you have to trust God with the circumstances. In this case, he said, I didn't come to destroy that. So he's telling me, I'm, I'm not telling you to ignore all that the scripture says, but he, he is going to tell us, but I want you to view this a little bit different. In, in wrapping this up, here's the key. Other than wartime or defense, you have absolutely no right to take the life of another person. Innocently. None whatsoever. Let's go back to Matthew 5, 22 and see what Jesus says. He's going to elevate that because remember the Pharisee says you have to have outward conformity. You must externally conform to what the scriptures say. But Jesus says, I'm going to tell you something different. It's more than what goes on on the outside. I want to talk to you about what I intended. I didn't intend you for, for you just not to kill. There's an other switch. You see, the opposite of not killing is loving. And I didn't intend for you just to think about what you shouldn't do, but also what you should do. What the thou shalt not will do is keep you from doing what going beyond the boundaries and doing wrong. But keep in mind, offense has two purposes. Offense is designed to keep some things in and other things out. But I found out if you love the one that is in the house so well, you won't need offense because you're going to stay there. You won't run away. In other words, not to kill is a good thing, but there's something better than just that command. What is it? He said, first of all, let's start with where your problem is. It's internally. You can say, but I hadn't killed nobody, but he said, that's not, that doesn't satisfy God. Because if you angry, watch it, with your brother without a cause. There's, this, this is the gas of the few that often leads to murder. Watch what's going on in our streets. You got people angry at a person they have, they have no idea who, they've never met him. But fueled by anger. Now watch the word, with his brother. And, and it's amazing in some of the shootings, the anger is, well, what did they do? They disrespected me. They dissed me. Crazy. Did they say something about your mama? No. Did they steal from you? No, they just dissed me. Crazy. Stupid stuff. What mean, what you mean by diss you? They looked at me funny. Well, if you going if people are gonna get shot for looking at folk funny, good night. Half of y'all wouldn't be here this morning, I'm telling you. <laughs> Crazy. You 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 disrespected me without a call. Stupid stuff. Makes no sense whatsoever. Angry without a cause. You got people that hate people they've never met. Angry with people they have never had any reaction with. Come on the job, man. Leave the job, man. Go home, man. Angry without a cause. And you know, anger is fuel. It's, it's fuel. All it needs is an igniter. So when you get a lot of angry people, they tell me in psychology there's a thing called blind rage. That oftentimes, when a person commits a murder, they've gotten so blind in their rage, they don't even remember doing it. And that's because they're fueling something called anger. And I've seen people, I know people who have been murdered for some of the silliest things in the world. Angry, without a cause. But watch this. He's going to say three things in this verse. Angry without a cause, you're going to be in danger of the judgment. If you tell your brother raka, the word raka means you're empty-headed. That means you don't have nothing going on in your brain. He says you're going to be in danger of the council. If you call the person a fool, you're going to be in danger of hellfire. 
You said, what's going on? There's something progressively moving forward. Anger leads to something else, which leads to something else. It's amazing how people can use words, and in those words, they mean the worst for you. They'll call your names. Don't know you. They'll call your names because they're in a rage with you, and they oftentimes, racial name, any name, just, just names. And what that shows you is there's something going on inside of that person. Now, while they may not have killed, Jesus says, I'm not looking at the killing part. He says, I'm going to tell you that the person who's there on that inside has already committed murder in their heart. He's telling them. Now, he says in verse 23, let me see if I can get you out of here quickly. You're a Christian. You're a believer. You're one who at least fear God. Let me put it that way. You go to some place of worship, and you're going in there to offer gifts to God. God will not allow you or me as a, as a, a person who says we know him through Christ to come into his house, sit in his assembly, sit in his presence, and have animosity towards a person in our heart and claim we love God. He won't do it. I don't care how much you sang Amazing Grace, if you hate your wife, hate your husband, children, you hate your parents, you cannot sit in a place of worship and saying, it is well with my soul. It's not well with your soul. <laughs> you can't do it because God will not allow such foolishness. He won't do it. And what he'll tell you is, when you are like that, I'm going to tell you, before you can deal with me, you need to go deal with the person. There are two people in verses 24 and 25. In verse 24, apparently it's the person who's done the offending. Now, he's not arguing against killing now. What he's arguing for is, there should really be nothing between people. And if there is, it's because people put it there and they allow it to stay. So he says what, what we should do, if you're here to worship, if you're here in the house of God, to go to the house of God anywhere, the one thing you need to do before you try to worship God, check what you brought God, go out to the person you've offended. He says, now leave your gift, go that way. What you're going to do is to try to be reconciled. What a wonderful word. Two people that have a problem and they get it together. Now there's a problem, there's the difficulty with getting something together when you need reconciliation is that oftentimes one person is waiting on the other to apologize. You apologize, no, you apologize, you apologize, no, you apologize. Then they say, I'm sorry, but you don't mean it. <laughs> no reconciliation going to happen there. Okay, and, and even when you say you're sorry, the, the problem is you say you're sorry and the attitude doesn't change, nor the actions. There's a problem. So he says, go get reconciled to your brother, then try to be reconciled. Now, there's a little layer to this. Well, what if I go to my brother and I ask him to forgive me, her to forgive me, and they don't forgive me? You've done your part. You go back and say, God, I did. Now it's on them. But you, you try to reconcile. Now what about the other side? Look at verse 25. He said, agree with thine adversary. That means the person who has been offended. The offender is in verses 23 and 24. But the person that's been offended also has some responsibility. In other words, we said, but I wasn't wrong. Does it mean because you wasn't wrong that you shouldn't take any steps? That you're going to set smug in your rightness? and wait until the first, the first move is made by the other person? It, it, it really takes a person bigger than that to make that first move. Are you hearing me? I may not have done anything wrong, which is usually not the case when it's two people, but I won't be the first one to take the first move to correct it. That's what you do when someone is adversarial, or at least your adversary, and it's not through something you've done. Now, he says, go to that person, because if you don't, here's the other side. 
You ask the person to forgive you, they refuse to forgive you, that's their problem. You ask the person to forgive you, they refuse to forgive you, that's your, their problem. But the goal is to try to reconcile, so you have to work at it. Now notice, here's what will happen if you don't. I need, Brother Strickland, I've been picking on you. Brother Strickland, I need you to forgive me for doing what I do, did or said what I said. Well, why would I do that? Because if I keep things small, they don't get big. Husband and wife, here's a lesson. Deal with things while they're small. Because what happened is you add something, then you add something else, then you add what happened on Tuesday, then you add what happened on Friday, and before you know it, your list so big, you forgot which one. It's all of it combined you can forgive them for. And that is why you want to deal with the, what the scripture called the little foxes that spoils the great. Deal with the little things first before they grow into something big. Don't we say that medically? That you deal with it while it's small so it doesn't become big? And you don't wait till it's big to attack it. That's wisdom that he's given us in this verse. Now verse 26, and I want to close. He says, this verse, verses 25 and 26, he says, you're going to prison and you're going to stay there and you're not going to get out by any means until you pay the uttermost fathering. Someone said, well, what are you talking about? That mean about going to hell? No. When you don't forgive a brother or sister, you lock yourself up in a prison. That the only person who has a key to it is you. Jesus talked about this in another parable where this man owed a little bit and he, and he went to the king. The king, king told, well, he owed the king a lot. King said, pay me. He said, I can't. King forgave him. He went out the door, ran into a man that owed him a little. Man said, I can't pay you. He grabbed him by the throat and said, you're going to pay me. The word got back to the king that the man he forgave a lot wouldn't forgive a man a little. And basically what he did was he locked himself up in prison. And there are some people who are imprisoned in their spirits because they, they, won't, they don't want to have a relationship like God wants them to have with a sister, brother. And watch this, that's across social, racial, that's across all kind of boundaries. And God is saying when you do that and you develop an attitude of hatred or animosity towards your brother, he says that's the same as if you killed him. Now don't go here and say, well, I might as well kill him. Because there are some consequences to that on the earth. But let me close. One verse, 1 John chapter, chapter 3. Or 1 John chapter 3. Watch what he says. 1 John chapter 3. Mm. Look at verse 15. Hmm. You there? 1 John 3.15. Watch it. Read it. If you hate, you're a murderer. That's exactly what Jesus has been teaching. And if you hate, and, and, and even if you haven't murdered them physically, Jesus said it, it is spiritual murder. And he says if you've done that and that's where you are, it indicates you don't have no life in you. Because that's not the life that God would want his children to read. It indicates there's a lack of life, the kind that he wants you to have. Look at chapter 4 and verse 20. And, and for those who holler, I love the Lord. John, 1 John 4, 20. If a man say, I love God. <laughs> Come on, you see it? And you hate your brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath seen? It makes no sense. Because the very man or woman you hate is created in the image of God. And therefore you have no right. Whenever a person takes a life, they're taking the life of someone who's created in God's image innocently. And to do that indicates there's something missing in you. You could not know God and do that. I wish, I wish I could holler that loud outside of these walls 
If it gets out on the internet, tell them come see me. I'll say it anywhere it need to be said. I'll say it on Bannister. You cannot go around here shooting people and hollering, you know God. You can't. You have moved into an arena. You're being held captive by somebody who's dictating your thoughts, your words, and your actions, and there is an accountability for it. Now, do I believe some people have gotten away with murder? No. No one will ever get away with murder. Ever. In my high school, we had a kid shot. <laughs> We'd played a football game. And uh, the game was over. I was riding the bus. Well, his name was Chopper, was one guy. I don't want to mention the other guy's name. But Chopper and I was on the bus with him. The bus dropped us off. I came home. Chopper and this guy got off at another location. Bus dropped them off and they split. Chopper, my friend, he heard a shot. He ran on home and then finally when they checked, that friend that we played football that was my teammate had gotten killed. Sad part about it is that teammate, he was dating a girl. This girl was dating two guys. And the one that other one got drunk, told everybody what he was going to do. His tire tracks was in the dirt. The ballistics on the gun was his. And he told people what he was going to do. And he was found not guilty. Now you ask me, did he get away with it? No. Temporal, yes. But he still has to give an account to God, as all people do. There are murders that have taken place that have never seen a courtroom on earth, but they got to see one someday. And, and I don't want to murder physically, but I don't want to murder nobody spiritually. Because I'll be just as guilty. I don't want to hate nobody. I don't want to have a cause against you. I want to treat you not just not my enemy, but my brother or my sister. That's where I'm supposed to be. I want to be forgiven and I want to forgive. That's where we need to be because I don't want the commandment, thou shall not kill, to ever be level that you broke that commandment. Okay? Don't assassinate people's character. That's another way of killing them. <laughs> Don't run them down when you know what you're saying is not true. That's also killing because you're assassinating a person's character. And the problem with an assassin is they do it from a distance, snipe, and take off. <laughs> so you got to be careful. What we want to do, church, is be obedient here. And the word is still out do not kill physically but do not kill spiritually. You got it? You said, but I got somebody I want to do some damage to. You better get over that. Okay, if they've done you wrong, vengeance is mine. I will get over it. Amen? Amen. Bow heads in prayer this morning. Well, thou shalt not kill. Matthew is not, as your heads are bowed and eyes closed, Matthew is not a book that tells you the plan of salvation. That plan is clear. This is a book that tells you the conduct that God's children ought to have because they're saved, not to get saved. But you've got to know the Lord as your personal Lord and Savior in order to live this life like he wants you to live. And so I want to invite anybody this morning who needs to find the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Uh, you might not have thought about killing, but that doesn't mean you're saved. But be sure that matter is settled. Is there anyone that said, Preacher, I'm not sure about my salvation, but I'm interested this morning. Would you, would you lift up a hand and let one of our workers take you in a room and talk to you? Is there anyone? Not sure.